Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google, we're good. So those are the killer apps right now. Um, it wasn't like this though. It wasn't like this in the past. Um, the, the first killer app that I used was Prince of Persia. <laughs> um, I didn't play it in, in Apple II, I played it in, uh, in Microsoft, I can't remember which one, I was too small. Um, and uh, that's, that made me dream about what you could do with computers. You could be, you could be a prince, you could do magical things. Um, so immediately when, when this came out, um, I, was the, I was the greatest fan. And let me tell you, one of the killer apps still today for me is uh, the Zelda Ocarina of Time. I still play it. Um, but, but there was a problem. There was a problem with this machine. Um, so one day I was playing outside. Uh, I, was in, I was in my village. And there was a big storm. I was on my bike. I was like 20 minutes away from home. I got soaking wet. Uh, but I was really hoping that I could go home and uh, play Ocarina of Time with my friends. Oh boy. That didn't happen because I had left the window open and my Nintendo 64 was next to the window. So the big storm wetted everything and uh, I lost my Nintendo 64. So the enemy for those killer apps was just a simple glass of water. A little bit of water could destroy those, those killer apps, this, this uh, Zelda Ocarina of Time. And you're laughing at me because I'm an idiot and I left the, the, the Nintendo 64 next to the window. But, uh, but you're going to laugh a bit more to, the, to these guys in the Metro of London who left the door open when they had some cement going on. Um, so, that was terrible for them, but nothing of this would have happened if they had what we have now. The cloud. So the cloud is extremely convenient, right? The cloud is amazing. The cloud uh, allows, us to, uh, allows us to use everything that we want from wherever we want. And this is, this is me using apps as an adult. Um, I use Spotify for my music, uh, I use uh, GitHub to check the code of my peers, and I use Google Docs to do this presentation, for example. And if I lose my laptop, what happens? Absolutely nothing. I can use it from here. Um, so, I know the story is that uh, the cloud is amazing. The cloud is really good. It frees us from the burden of storing, of backing up. You can access it from, out, from wherever. You can, you can do the computation of extremely complex apps somewhere else and use it with a device that is not so powerful. Um, it is very, very inexpensive as opposed to buying the hardware uh, every time that you want to play a game, like, like my Ocarina of Time, and uh, it's tremendously scalable. Um, so in summary, um, the cloud is just very, very convenient. Uh, let me prove a point here. Um, who here runs an Ethereum node? All right, few of you. Oh, no, no. That's pretty good. Um, who runs it in a VPS? Why? Uh, is uh, maintenance and maintenance security. security. Who else was running in a VPS? Come on, there was more people. Why? Don't have a home. Fantastic. Exactly. So, so basically, <laughs> that, that's a good one. Um, so basically, you run it because it's it's very convenient, right? It's very convenient. Um, so we've we've looked. That, that sort of proves the point of how convenient, especially if you don't have a home, um, to to run to run any application that you want, including an Ether node. Um, Let's, we've looked at the apps that, that I use and the apps that I used to use, but let's look at the apps that the world is using. This is, when I say Fang, more broadly, uh, what I mean is this. Those are, those are the apps that people are using the most on, on their phones right now. And I took the, the liberty of investigating a little bit where those apps are hosted. Because yeah, you have Facebook on your phone, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all the magic happens on your phone. So, so what I found out is that, well, um, four of the top five, are in Facebook, uh, Facebook servers. Facebook, Facebook has massive data centers. Um, we can we can call it the Facebook Cloud, even if it's, they, they don't sell it, they don't sell cloud services. Um, uh, four of them are in Google Cloud. Two of them are in AWS. Two of them use uh, a multi-cloud approach, meaning uh, Google and AWS, and probably some others like DigitalOcean. Who knows? Um, five of them. Uh, they use cloud services, but they're mostly Chinese companies, and they're not. Uh, they do not disclose who those uh, infrastructure providers are. But I've checked on their uh, annual reports, and they use uh, cloud um, services. And three of them do not use the cloud. Why? Because they're media players. Um, and arguably, the distribution of these apps, if it happens through Google Play, happens through the cloud as well. But the, the app itself does not need 
um, the cloud, right? Um, how much does it cost to have this app running? 13 billion on network infrastructure for Google. Last year, this year they have not um, Snap, who was on that list, pays 600 million a year to Google and to AWS, uh, AWS. Lyft, 100 million. Slack, 50 million. Pinterest, 125 million. Who the hell is this Pinterest <laughs> um, Apple, 360 million per year. Did you know that Apple Cloud is actually Amazon Web Services Cloud? <laughs> so just five clients bring us to one and a quarter billion US dollar a year. If you look at some of the um, uh, of the forecast of the industry, it's 83 billion in three years. That's a lot of money, and those apps are free. Mind blowing. Um, there's two apps that are have a subscription model, Netflix and Spotify, and two of them, Uber and Amazon, is a pay per use, so the app downloading the app is free, but actually, if you want to use the services, you, you have to pay. Those apps are free. And they're spending billions a year supporting the infrastructure. But you guys are not dumb. You guys are in this room. I know I'm preaching to the choir here. But you know, you know what happens when the apps are free, right? <laughs> what they're selling is your day. And that's cool. Nobody, nobody cares. It's, it's even fun. Um, everybody knows that. Everybody knows it. And we laugh at it when, when we read Apple contractors regularly hear confidential details. They hear people having sex. Yeah, it's even funny, right? Unless you're homosexual and you live Saudi, in Saudi Arabia where you could get killed. What if somebody reports you? So that's a little bit less fun. Um, there was another example of data that was, that was misused when it fell into the wrong hands. So we're in March uh, 1940. Uh, Germany invades uh, the Netherlands. And the Netherlands at that point was one of the most progressive countries that we had in the world. And uh, they were um, a secular country, and they had one of the most just ways of dealing with religion, which means that they had a religious budget um, on their annual accounts, and they split it accordingly to the number of uh, the percentage of the population that was of one religion or another. Which means that in the census, they knew what religion was everyone. So the Germans come in, they just go to the census office, they look and they have the name and the address of every single Jew in the Netherlands. That's why the Netherlands has the biggest uh, in terms in percentage and in um, uh, absolute terms of uh, Jews deceased during the uh, Second World War. Um, right, so we don't have to go so far, we don't have to go to, to Germany in, in the 1940s um, to, um, to see examples of how data can be misused. Everybody knows about Cambridge Analytica, now they've, they've boomed. Um, we probably, our any Brits here, um, probably if it wasn't for them, you guys would have a different outcome, probably. The what if scenarios are, have never been my favorite, but it is, it is for sure that they used um, data to target people that were on the fence and tip the balance to one side. There's another person that uh, used uh, Cambridge Analytica services, another president, um, and uh, do you know, you know how much you know how much he paid for Cambridge Analytica services? Make, make a guess. How much does it cost to win an election? Ten million. Low. Lower. Oh, five. Five million. Five million. A cool five million. You get data of pretty much everybody that has a Facebook account. And uh, you can go really deep. Um, this, this here, this is the, the former CEO of Cambridge Analytica. And uh, they based their work on Alexander Krasinski. Uh, I can look it up for you guys. Um, there's, um, so there's a researcher um, that uh, created back, like, a long time ago, created um, uh, a series of algorithms that with 150 clicks, 150 likes on Facebook, they could know you better than your best friends. They knew things about you, there were more things about you than your best friends. If you are a closeted gay, they fucking knew. Um, right, so... Um, this data is dangerous and can be used for uh, the wrong things, and this is happening right now. Um, does that 
make people not use these apps? Is, that, is, is privacy really a value proposition? Look at how many users do we have on WhatsApp, which is owned by, by Facebook. One billion daily users. Daily users. I am one of them. Uh, Messenger, almost one billion. Um, TikTok, 200 million, where you put your videos, you put everything, you're, you're almost half naked there, they, they know everything about you. Um, Facebook, 1.6 billion, that's a lot of people, daily users. Um, and, and just for, for comparison, let's look at this. This weekend I look at the uh, separated apps, and, and that's the, that's, the, that's the 3,000, 3,000 users. Um, there we go. <coughs> but we were doing great, I mean, we, like, we were fine. Um, <laughs> I think we need to improve, um, and, and I suggest that uh, we take another model, we take another approach, we take another approach that takes the power out of that, out of all these cloud services. How do we get our apps, our decentralized apps, to get close, even close, to, to the traditional apps levels of adoption? Uh, well, first of all, they need to be free. Free, okay, yeah. What else? What was the magic word? Convenient. convenient. They need to be easy to use. They need to be convenient. They need to be convenient. There's this, this unspoken rule, well, written, um, that says that more or less a technology, just because it's better, does it, will not take over the previous technology. It needs to be 10 times better. Um, so we need, to be, we need to make things that are 10 times better than, than the things that are just the killer apps right now, which are not Ethereum at this point. Um, and what's better than free? Get paid for it. Get paid for it, and we're paying a lot of money to this cloud provider, so I suggest a personally owned distributed cloud that shifts the transfer of value from the cloud cartel to the user. So this is the current model right now, where the data is paid, well, the, the, the money comes from selling the data and goes to the cloud provider. There's also other flows, but I want to focus specifically on that flow of money because we have one thing that they don't have, and it's a native way to transfer value. So I suggest that if I want to do a decentralized Spotify, we do it like this. We pay the users to host this task for us. For us. I would use the Spotify that pays me. Uh, I'm sorry for you, you couldn't, you couldn't because you don't have a house, you can't, you can't have it when you're in a house, but maybe you can put it in a VPS as well. Should be fine. Um, so I suggest that here, when we have Spotify, somebody pays, yeah, okay, most of that are free, we're gonna touch into that. Um, they be here and we transfer the value to the user. Um, we're, we're far away from that. We're far away from that, and, and I'm gonna try to make a list of what pieces need to come together to create a model where this would work. Number one, it needs to be as convenient, as accessible, from anywhere and all the time, like the cloud is. This is not a 10x, this is a, this is a, this is a bare minimum. We need this, and we don't have it right now. It's a pain in the ass. Um, but we're working on this, we're working on the infrastructure side to make this infrastructure better, more accessible from everywhere. So how? We're working with um, Archibald, we're working, I'm going to use uh, some two DevOps concepts here. Um, a high availability cluster is, everyone knows what it is, it's basically, so it, it's a series of nodes that are connected and when the first one goes down, the second one takes over. Uh, Archibald is developing a, a system uh, specifically targeted to ETH 2.0. Um, so anybody can, uh, can, can start staking from their own homes. Um, you create a federation with your friends, and, uh, and if your node goes down, the second node takes over, and then you avoid being slashed because of uh, downtime on, on your node. So good, we're, we're getting closer to high availability here. Um, there's another thing uh, called load balancing in DevOps, which is basically distributing the load through the nodes or the servers that, that, are, that are there. And there's Pocket Network over there, um, who are doing an excellent job on creating this, this orchestrator right here that, that redirects uh, the traffic or the transactions to uh, the nodes that are, that are online. So we've got high availability, we've got load balancing, we're, we're getting somewhere there. But this is just the bare minimum. This is not a 10x. Another thing that's not a 10x is throughput and scalability. Um, there's things that are going to help us get better with scalability. I'm not an expert on that, I'm not going to touch on it, but the roll-up with uh, Zero Knowledge Proofs, Ethereum 2.0, Layer 2, I'm sure you guys are absolute experts on that. Um, this is, we, we need it. It's a bare minimum. 
But we're starting to get somewhere with privacy. We said that privacy wasn't a killer proposition, wasn't a value proposition, but it is. Just not on its own. It's not 10 times bad. It is four times better. Why do I say that? Because given the chance of using a private app and a, an app that sells you data, and they work exactly the same, meaning that they're, that they're exactly the, um, the same level of availability and the same level of transactions, etc., etc., you will use them on the private. But we're at the very minimum right here. Um, on the infrastructure side, what we can do to ensure privacy, we can include in that hardware, we can include. Um, uh, uh, environments, trusted environments like, like the one on, on SGX, uh, we can create, and then with zero knowledge proofs, we can create them within those enclaves, and uh, that's available for uh, the app users to do whatever they want uh, in, a, in a secure and private way. Also, we, we've seen that the model means it worked for um, apps that had, the Spotify worked for somebody that um, was paying for a subscription, and then you pay the user to, to host it, right? Um, there's other models. There's data fund, for example, which is a way more ethical way of, uh, of using uh, the data. So we don't have to just throw away all the data, and, but we should be able um, to let people opt in on what data they want to give and to whom. Um, another thing that needs to happen is incentivization. incentivization. Uh, Pocket Network, ETH 2.0, Storage, Raiden, Vibno, there are many projects out there and we can, one of them will not give you enough money to run a project. But if you, st if you stack them on top of the other, on the same machine, you start having a money box in your house that, that, gives, you, that gives you enough money to sustain the save the box itself. Um, so, that's, that's not a 10x yet. There's one more component. There need to be apps that people use, and that people can use, and they can be easy to use. Um, give value to users. It's not only UX and UI, I'm sorry, I, I should have changed that. It's, it's basically value proposition. Give value to the users. Most of the apps right now use the hook. I don't know who's familiar with, with the hook model here, but basically what they do is they, they trick you into using it all the time. They make you addicted, they make you hooked, because the most killer app in this universe is, a, is an app that buzzes every time somebody from the other side of the world gives you a like on your picture and that buzzes on your phone and you look at it and then you like another thing and then you put it back into the pocket and then it buzzes again because some other person has clicked onto something. Something as stupid as clicking is designed to make you addicted to it. So when you develop apps, please make sure that you're not a dealer. Make sure that you actually want to use it and make sure that it materially improves the user's life. This is the way we're going to have apps that can compete, at least, with, with the current model. So, what we're doing at that note is taking care of the infrastructure side. We are working on the first part, on the infrastructure, having this infrastructure being available from everywhere. Um, Throughput scalability, the Ethereum Foundation, and everybody is very, very much focused on that. Um, privacy, we're including SGX and we're including systems uh, inside our boxes that uh, you can leverage uh, for your dApps and make, it, uh, make them private and secure. Incentivization, uh, we, with E2.0, that will help us a lot, but you need to do the last part. You need to create apps that give value. And I suggest that the next time you're doing a human-centered design system to, um, to create an app, think about this model. Think about Instead of giving money to the cloud providers who are going to take this data and they're going to use it for God knows what, think about this. Think about making people host it, incentivize people to host your dApps. Um, if you want to know how to do it, please get in touch. Uh, we can help you um, design something on that note that will be uh, hopefully almost as good as using uh, BPS or even more convenient. Thank you very much.